As you're finding your seats, I'd invite you to open your Bible to Revelation chapter 15. The last book of our Bible, and we'll pick up where we left off last week. We'll be looking this morning at verses 5 through 8. I don't know if you've done the homegrown chemistry experiment, the one with a bottle of Coke and Mentos. If you have, you know that when the Mentos tablets drop into the bottle of Coke, and and I think Diet Coke works even better, you recognize the volatile combination, uh, a veritable fountain of foam spews out of the top of the bottle. And people have powered small rockets and other mobile devices with such combinations. And chemistry is fascinating because there are things you can put together when, when they come together, they can be explosive. And sometimes you can have some substance that interferes with the mixture. And when that interference is removed, the, the mixture goes haywire. I want to suggest to you this morning that the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man do not mix well. It is the fundamental problem of humanity that God is holy and that we are sinful. It is the fundamental problem of the Bible that God is holy and perfect and just and true and clean and good and righteous and that we, his creatures, are born in rebellion against him, who sin by nature, who sin by activity. We sin in words and deeds and thoughts and motives. In fact, the Bible paints the human condition as being born in transgressions and sins and dead in transgressions and sins. This is, of course, the great problem of the Bible that... Only the Bible answers. How can a holy God tolerate human evil? In other words, how can God maintain his holy reputation and not punish evildoers? If there is a solution, it it must come from God. It cannot come from us. Theodicy is the word that is given to the philosophical study of the problem of evil. Philosophers meander pointlessly, irreverently, and dangerously around the question, why do bad things happen? Surely bad things can't happen if there exists a good God. How can there be moral calamity and environmental calamity if God exists, if the God who does exist is both good and powerful? What they should be asking And the question only the Bible can answer is this, how can I be forgiven my moral calamities since God is both good and powerful? That is the real problem. That is the real question. Because God's goodness means he loves what is good. And God's goodness means that he hates the enemies of good. And when we talk about God's justice, it is a good justice and a holy justice. The justice of God is, in fact, his holy goodness expressed as a response to right and wrong. And we sinners cry for justice when we have been negatively affected by the sins of others. And we want justice when the bully terrorizes the neighborhood. But we don't want justice when we're the ones who have done the wrong. If God is truly good, infinitely good, if God hates wickedness, if he is just and holy and must punish sin, and if his world that he made is filled with image bearers who have rebelled against him, who have failed to worship him, failed to thank him, who have taken the created things and made things from the created things that they will worship instead of worshiping him. If the world has done all of that, why has God not blotted out rebellious humanity from the earth long ago? And that question has an answer that is also found in the Bible. What is it that has prevented the Diet Coke and the Mentos from meeting one another? The holiness of God 
and the sinfulness of man. Why has this not erupted in terminal violence, righteous, good, and holy judgment? Listen, all those philosophers that say if God were good, he'd come and stop the evil now, must not realize that God would stop their heartbeats were he to do so. What prevents the mixture? Mercy. God choosing for a time to not give humanity what it deserves. Patience. That characteristic in the divine nature that outlasts wrongdoing, that endures mistreatment, that is long-suffering with malevolent rebellion. Love. God has a purpose for his inner Trinitarian love, the love of the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit that they enjoyed for all of eternity, to burst out into creatures who could enjoy and benefit from his love. And how do we see that love? God loved us when we were at our worst. He loved his enemies. God is putting his love on display, and so there are enemies who live for a while. What else stops this mixture? Intercessory prayer. People pray, and God relents, and God uses prayers as a means of not bringing down everything that is deserved quite yet. This mixture is also prevented by God's purpose. He has a plan, he has decrees, he will uphold his purpose. He will get glory for himself by doing the things he's doing the way he's doing them. And there is election. There are people whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And the world will spin while God is patient and he executes his love to redeem all that are his. And he will not fail. But you must know, friend, that a day is coming when mercy will get out of the way. Patience will retire. Prayer will not intercede. Elective purpose will be finished. And justice will roll up its sleeves. Let's read the text before us this morning. Revelation 15, beginning in verse 5. After these things, I looked, writes John the Apostle, and the sanctuary of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels who have the seven plagues came out of the sanctuary, clothed in linen, clean and bright, girded around their chests with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to these, your words, this morning. You authored them through the revelator, John, the apostle, on that island of Patmos now nearly two millennia ago. And your words, written so long ago, are not static, but dynamic, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce internals, separating out which we can't even separate. Lord, you know thoughts and motives. You know every heart in this place this morning. Would you be pleased by the power of your word, wielded in the hands of your Holy Spirit, would you be pleased to dissect, to reveal, to expose, to change this morning? I pray that we would not leave here the same, but that your word would have its way in us. God, we pray even now that those who are in rebellion against you, who are hearing these words, these gracious words of invitation and warning, would turn and believe the gospel and be saved from what is to come. We pray that you would do all these things and many more things than we even know to ask 
And it is in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. In our passage this morning, we are looking at three events that activate the final series of judgments against the world. Three events in this passage that activate the final series of judgments against the world. Like a bottle of Diet Coke, things are waiting to happen and there is an activator that will set them in motion. These three events activate the final series of judgments. The first event is the opening of the heavenly temple. We see this in verse 5. After these things, I looked, and the sanctuary of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. This scene is arresting. It depicts for us the exposure of a sinful world to the inner sanctum of a holy God. For thousands of years, God has been exposed to human depravity. Every sin that has been committed, every vile thought that has been thunk, Every motive that has lain underneath actions and activities have all been open before God in heaven. He has seen them all. He has heard them all. He is a witness to them all. God has been exposed to the whole host of human depravity. And in the final scene of this age of human rebellion, human depravity will be exposed to the holiness of God in a fullness it has never yet seen. Chapter 15, verse 5, picks up the chronology from chapter 11, verse 19. Turn a few pages back to Revelation 11. And look at verse 19. Revelation 11 concluded for us the seventh trumpet judgment. And after Jesus will open the scrolls, breaking the seal, there will be seven seal judgments, the seventh one opening up seven trumpet judgments, the seventh trumpet judgment leading to the last seven bowl judgments. And chapter 11 ends us at that seventh trumpet. And we read in verse 19, And the sanctuary of God which is in heaven was opened. And the ark of the covenant appeared in his sanctuary, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. Heaven is experiencing these seismic activities in preparation for the final series of judgments, the bold judgments. Chapter 11, verse 19 tells us the seventh trumpet opened and, or sounded and then heaven was opened. And Revelation 15, 5 picks up where that left off. I looked, and the sanctuary of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And everything that happened between 1119 and 15, 5 was an interlude. If you were not aware that we were into an intermission, an explanation, a backstory, a subplot, and an interlude for the last number of weeks together, that's where we've been. I had, I had several people ask me this week, can I get a timeline Uh, Where are we in the book of Revelation? Where's the timeline of of events? Uh, We'll put that up on the screen for you next week. But just, you might even mark in the margin of your Bible that 1119 and 155 are sort of the seams of the fabric of the narrative portion of the book of Revelation. And, And the seam has been ripped so that we can see what is behind the scenes in the last several chapters. When John says, after these things, this is a a very explicit time marker in the book of Revelation that advances the chronology. It resumes the narrative. It, It carries on with the story after the interlude of explanations. So what did we learn during the interlude? Well, we were introduced to some of the actors, some of the players in the final scene. We saw the great sign, the woman who was Israel. We saw the story of her son, the Messiah. We were introduced to the great red dragon, that is Satan. We, we learned about the beast, that is the Antichrist, and the second beast, the false prophet. We were briefly introduced to Babylon, that mysterious world system of religion, politics, and commerce. We saw the preserved remnant of Israel. We witnessed the saved and the persecuted Gentiles. We were introduced to those two witnesses who were murdered and resurrected in the streets of Jerusalem. And then we saw the 144,000 
the 12,000 from each tribe of Israel, the Jewish male evangelists who are sealed all the way through the tribulation and serve to proclaim the gospel everywhere. And then we were also introduced to those proclaiming angels, one of whom was preaching an eternal gospel to the entire globe, publishing mercy and good news in a coming king. During that interlude, we were also given subplots, the behind-the-scenes narratives, background information that we will need to know as the story continues from chapter 15 onward. We learned of the past, present, and future history of Messiah, his first coming, and then his second coming to rule the nations. We learn about that future war in heaven. It's, it's future to us in Revelation 12 when Satan and demons will finally be expelled from heaven, no longer having access there, and in the last days they will be confined only to the earth, and they will rage with fury. We learned how the Antichrist and the false prophet will consolidate power, subjugate and terrorize the whole world. We learned that there will be a reaping, a harvest of wickedness in the final bowl judgments. We learned as well that there would be a final gathering of the remaining people of the earth into vast armies for the battle of Armageddon, prepared to fight against Messiah at his return. And then last week, we listened to the songs that will be sung in heaven on the eve of Messiah's victory. Those were all subplot, backstory, informational interludes to the continuation of the narrative, the chronology. We pick up that chronology here in verse 5. And just as we saw in 1119, we see here in 155, heaven opened the sanctuary and John records there, after these things, I looked. And his eyes are drawn to something. Our eyes are drawn to that something. This is a dramatic shift in focus. We saw the temple opened up in 1119, and, and here it is opened up. It is the same scene. And back in chapter 11, we saw inside the tabernacle, the ark, the ark of the covenant, the, the lost ark there in heaven. The last record of the ark on earth is in 2 Chronicles 35. In the days of King Josiah, one of the kings of Judah, one of the last kings of Judah, and he placed the ark in the house of Yahweh in the inner sanctum of the temple that Solomon built. In Jeremiah 52, we learn of Nebuchadnezzar's invasion of Jerusalem, and we learn that the Babylonians burnt down the temple and took whatever was in it. And then the next place we see the ark is in heaven, in Revelation 19, 11, 19. We're not told if Nebuchadnezzar hauled the ark off to Babylon or if God removed it from the temple in Jerusalem before he got there. We don't know. And some have surmised that it went to the Smithsonian and then to Area 51 in some deep cavern military bunker. I don't subscribe to that view. I believe the Ark of the Testimony was transported to heaven. Here in Revelation 15, the temple in heaven is called the sanctuary of the tabernacle of the testimony. That's an important grouping of words. The, the sanctuary is that inner portion of the temple precincts. When you have the temple and the sanctuary, the temple could be all of the walls, all of the buildings, the inner and outer courts, but the, the sanctuary was the inner portion. It was the place where God dwelt, and, and inside that inner sanctuary, the, the Holy of Holies, is, is the place where God specially manifested His glory when He was there. And the word tabernacle is not the word temple. Uh, we might expect to be thinking about a, a rebuilt temple in Antichrist day, or maybe the millennial temple, or, or maybe the Herodian temple that stood in, in the time of Christ. But he doesn't use any of those words. He uses the word tabernacle. That's the tent. That's the, the porpoise-skinned version that was in the wilderness. It was collapsible. It, it was packed up and moved along. And it had the outer section and the inner section. It had the Holy of Holies. And it had all of the furniture. And, and inside the Holy of Holies, it had the golden box. Ark just means box. It was a, a rectangular box 
overlaid entirely with gold, and, and inside it were some important items. And so the word here used for tabernacle is the word for the tent of meeting in the wilderness. The word that was used before Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem, the, the word that was used before the rebuilt temple after the exile, and then Herod's temple built before the time of Christ. And in the tabernacle was this Ark of the Covenant. Here it is called the Tabernacle of the Testimony. And the Tabernacle of the Testimony is the word used throughout the Old Testament to describe the tent that housed the holy place with the golden box. And inside that golden box were the stone tablets of the very law of God. Listen to Exodus 25, 16. You shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. Such an interesting word. He could have said the Ten Commandments. He could have said the stone tablets. He calls them the testimony. Why? Because they testify to God's holiness. They testify to God's law, His moral regulations flowing out of His very being. Because they were to be housed in the very place where God would dwell in the midst of His people. Now think about that. The, the uncontainable, infinite God of the universe desired to be with sinful people. Remember, this is a dangerous mixture. Why were there courts and curtains and sacrifice, and why was there blood everywhere? Well, because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin, and sinful human beings in the presence of a holy God are annihilated. God desires to be in the midst of his people, and so he established ways where they could be near to him, and he be near to them, and they be called by his name, and he be called by theirs. He is a relational God, not a transcendent abstract being to be philosophized about. He is the covenant-keeping Yahweh. Yes, he's self-existent from all eternity past, Yes, he is beyond all knowing, and yet he entered into time and space with people in relationship and desires to be known. And we can't get past the antinomy or the apparent contradiction, but not really a contradiction in God in these things. And all of his attributes are like this. Think about God's love. When Paul says to the Ephesians how he was praying for them, he prays that they would know the love of God, which is beyond knowledge. Have you ever thought about that? This gets down to the very fundamental definition of what it means to know God, what it means to have eternal life, to, to know him in our finite brains, means to do so forever because he is utterly, infinitely, transcendently incomprehensible. And yet he desires to be known. And so there's this box in a tent in the wilderness surrounded by the people God has chosen into, to enter into relationship with. Numbers 153, the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony so that there will be no wrath on the congregation of the sons of Israel. The Levites shall keep charge of the tabernacle of the testimony. So this tent in the wilderness was called the tent of the box with the law. The presence of God testifying to who he is and what he is like and his moral demands of his people. Right there in the center of camp. Inside this box was not only the stone tablets inscribed by God, but a jar of manna, a reminder of God's provision, and then Aaron's rod that had budded. But by the time the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, the only thing that was in the ark was the testimony itself, the Ten Commandments. 2 Chronicles 5.10 says, There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets which Moses put there at Horeb when Yahweh made a covenant with the sons of Israel when they came out of Egypt. This tabernacle of the testimony is important. It's a physical, tangible emblem of God's desire to dwell with his people and his ability out of his own nature to regulate their lives. It bears witness in heaven to the law of God. It bears witness on earth to the law of God, those holy standards that his righteousness requires. And interestingly, in the end times, 
this inner sanctum, this tabernacle of the testimony, will show up in the center of heaven with the holiness of God and, and God's reputation emanating out. God had made a covenant with Israel. He gave holy regulations to them. The ark gave testimony to his presence amidst his people and his right to rule them. And notice in verse 5, that is open in heaven. That should be stunning. If you know your Bible, that inner sanctum was always closed off. Nobody could enter it except the high priest and that only once a year. Uh, there were layers of mediation. The blood of animals spilled as innocent substitutes to pave the way. And priests as go-betweens between a sinful people and a holy God. And here... The doors are open, not cordoned off by curtains and barriers and sacrifices and ceremonies. God in his abject holiness is breaking out. Listen, the ten in the midst of the people protected the people from God. God pledged himself to save, to save people. To save sinners who could not of their own merit qualify to be in his glorious presence. Mediation, patience, mercy, substitutionary sacrifice, all leading and pointing to that great sacrifice that is written for us in Hebrews chapter 8. The main point that is being said, Hebrews 8, 1, we have a high priest who sat down on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister in the holy places and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. Verse 11, he says, I will forgive their sins and I will remember their sins no more in this new covenant. In chapter 9, verse 11, when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy places once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. All of those Old Testament ceremonies were pointing towards the final consummate reality that God would do through Jesus Christ. And Jesus did all of that at the cross on behalf of all who would believe. We fast forward to the end of this era and we see the exposure of a sinful world to that inner sanctum of a holy God. For all these thousands of years, God has been exposed to human depravity. In the final scene of this age of human rebellion, human depravity will be exposed to the holiness of God. But without the merits of Christ, without intermediary priests, with no go-betweens, no protections, heaven is opened up and the inner sanctum is opened and all those who have been granted access by the blood of Christ uh, will find out what happens all those who have not been granted access by the blood of Christ will find out what happens when the holiness of God is unobstructed in the presence of sinful humanity. And that leads to the second event that activates these final judgments. The second event is the holy agents commissioned. Look down at verse 6. And the seven angels who have the seven plagues, came out of the sanctuary, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chests with golden sashes. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. We have here at the ready the seven angels holding the seven plagues. The seal judgments led to the trumpet judgments lead to the bowl judgments. Here are the bowl judgments. The final series of judgments in rapid succession. The details are found in chapter 16. We'll look through those, Lord willing, next time. 
And they are worse than all of the judgments that have gone before. They are called here plagues that is reminiscent of the plagues of judgment on Egypt. And most of the plagues in these seven bowl judgments are similar to the Egyptian plagues, except they are international in their scope. Those were literal, historical catastrophes that brought devastation to the land and financial ruin to the economy of the world's mightiest nation. These future plagues will also be literal, historical catastrophes that will bring devastation to every land and financial ruin to the whole world's economy. Will you be able to collect your insurance check? Where will FEMA be? Will the United Nations send out patrols? Will the NGOs go to help put the pieces back together? No, at the end of all of these plagues, the world will be rubble. There will be no rebuilding. In fact, the last of these judgments coincides with the return of King Jesus to annihilate all remaining enemies on the scorched earth. And as we look at these bold judgments, can I give us a gentle reminder? Try to not correlate these judgments to current events. These things aren't happening now. They haven't happened yet. There are things that will predate these events. There is a, a type of pursuit of eschatology that looks for fulfillment in the newspapers. I have shelves of books filled with that approach. It's not helpful. It actually undermines the message of the Bible in, in, in maybe a big-hearted attempt to prove the Bible is true. See, here's a prophecy, and it's happening right now in the papers. And the problem is it, it undermines the Scriptures. It damages our understanding of the Bible. It damages our understanding of how to understand the Bible. Listen, no one will need to prove correlation when these bold judgments happen. They will be unmistakable. It will not be a mystery. Can I give you a newspaper fulfillment example from the late 1800s? Reading a commentator this week who, who believes these are literal future events. He takes the book of Revelation at face value, and yet he was reporting in his own day the way that people that were really excited about eschatology saw them being fulfilled in their own time. Bowl number one, the French Revolution. Bowl number two, the naval battles during the French Revolution. Bowl number three, Napoleon's military campaigns in Italy. Bowl number four, Napoleon's political tyranny and military oppression. Bowl number five, calamities in Rome resulting from the French Revolution. Bowl number six, the decline of Turkish power, the return of Jews to Palestine, and the rise of false teaching. And bowl number seven, Protestant and Catholic conflict and physical violence in the city of Rome. That was a very common view, and, and it was the trendy view, and, and everybody in that day believed it. As we've been making our way through the book of Revelation, you, you may be tempted to think we are right around the corner, and we could be. Some generation is going to be right in thinking so, but we haven't yet seen fulfillments. Fulfillments will be unmistakable. They, they will not take somebody putting some mysterious details together from four unconnected news sources and saying, aha, that's it. No one will need to be told. These will be awful. They will be the worst cataclysms the world has ever seen. They will follow precisely in order, and they will be literally fulfilled as the text describes. Notice the angels here in verse 6 are clothed in brilliant white garments. The seven angels who have the seven plagues came out of the sanctuary clothed in linen, clean and bright. They have golden sashes on their chests. This is a depiction of their purity. They are holy as heaven is holy. Their very clothes reflect the purity of heaven and the glory of heaven. The, these sort of white garments are seen on the Lord Jesus. They are seen on glorified saints, and, and they are seen on these angelic messengers. They are God's holy angels. They are commissioned to bring this final installment of judgment to the earth. And the clean, white, 
pure, gleaming garments indicate to us that their work is holy and good. It is God's work, and the judgments of God are right and clean and pure. You have to understand that judgment is not God's bad side. It has to be balanced out somehow. It, this is stark, brilliant goodness, which disallows evil and will finally put evil away. And notice that one of the four living beings initiates this final round. Verse 7, one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls. These are the fiery winged creatures that we saw in Isaiah chapter 6, crying out, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. And keep in mind that these four living beings in the closest circle to the throne of heaven the fiery ones from Isaiah 6 and the cherubim from Ezekiel chapter 1. They have never sinned. They do not sin now and they will never sin. They are absolutely pure beings without a taint of evil. And yet they cry out before the throne day and night, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh. They know that the uncreated creator is fundamentally different than everything made. And they have seen Yahweh in His holiness their entire existence. They're in the inner circle of holy beings that cover their faces in the presence of the holiness of God. And one of these beings gives to the seven angels the seven bowls. The bowls here are large and shallow dishes. They were used in the temple to carry incense to the altar. In fact, previously in the book of Revelation, these bowls of incense held the prayers of the saints offered before God as worship. These might be different bowls here. They might be the same bowls. But remember, those bowls of incense were the prayers of the saints as they cried out for justice. They cried out, how long, O Lord? They are the collected prayers of the saints from all time saying, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. This is the longing of believers through prayer in heaven. And now those prayers are to be answered. The bowls here in this scene are said to be full of the wrath of God, verse 7. That is filled to the brim. Earth dwellers haven't yet had the fullness. The seals and the trumpet judgments will have been awful, but these last judgments will be the most terrible the world will have ever seen. What has been held back will be held back no longer. It will be thrown down, dumped out on the whole earth. And notice whose wrath this is. Look at the end of verse 7. This is the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. This phrase from eon to eon, from eternity to eternity is a phrase used 21 times in the book of Revelation. One time it's used of the unending bliss of believers. Three times it's used of the unending torment of unbelievers. And all the rest, 17 times, it's used of God and His being. And make no mistake, every human is eternal in the sense of having a starting point and never having an ending point. As C.S. Lewis said, you will never meet a mere mortal. Every human being who's ever been on the earth lives forever. A starting point and never an ending point. The question is, where will you live? How will you live? And there's only two options. But God is not like that in his eternality. Our eternality is derivative. It is given to us by God, sustained by God. But God's eternality is intrinsic. It is natural to him. It is who he is. He just simply is. And his eternality not only goes into eternity's future, but also into eternity's past. He has always been. He has never not been. And he is called the God who lives forever and ever. This is a contrast to all false deities. This is a contrast to the beast and the false prophet. It is a contrast to Satan. It is a contrast to anything we would trump up inside our own hearts to be tempted to love more than we love God. 
This designation of God as the God who lives forever and ever shows up in that consequence of eternal torment. He lives forever and ever, never to be appeased in the unfolding of his wrath against those who do not believe the gospel. And so Hebrews 10.31 says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. To think about God having always been as he is in his holiness, justice, purity, and having held back his judgment by mercy, by long-suffering, patient endurance of a rebellious world, a world where the gospel has been preached. Mercy has held back the flood of wrath that has been deserved for thousands of years we come to this scene where justice rolls up its sleeves. There is one more event described here that sets the stage for the last phase. It is the agitation of divine justice. Look down at verse 8. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. We come to this scene in verse 8 where the inner sanctuary opened up and now is filled with smoke that makes it impenetrable. God is the one who dwells in unapproachable light. And here that light is mixed with a, a thick cloud of smoke that no one can go in. In the Old Testament, the smoke accompanying God's presence often presaged judgments. In Isaiah chapter 6, you'll remember that the temple filled with smoke, and what followed in the second half of chapter 6 is God's pronouncements of judgments against corrupt and hypocritical Israel, to which he commissioned his prophet Isaiah to preach. In Exodus chapter 40, the tabernacle was filled with smoke there in the wilderness. In 1 Kings 8, at the dedication of the temple by Solomon, the, the inner sanctum was filled with smoke. And we see it here in this scene. And God is to be left alone. The text tells us no one is able to enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. I want you to think about the contrast of that statement to the entirety of your Bible. Think about what your Bible is. Two chapters at the beginning, two chapters at the end, where God dwells with man, with no mediation, and it's good. Genesis 1 and 2, Revelation 21, 22. Everything in between Sin, rebellion, death, but mediation, grace, and the whole invitation of the Bible is, you got kicked out of the garden, I want you to come back in, and the only way to come back in is through the blood of my son. Come. In fact, the invitation of Isaiah 55, why are you spending all of your money on stuff that won't satisfy? Come to me. Jesus' gracious invitations. If you believe in me, you'll be a fountain of life flowing up from within. Your whole Bible is a, is a gracious invitation from the God who made you to get back in where we got kicked out of at the beginning. Except even better. The last two chapters of your Bible are way better than the first two. And they never end. But in this scene, in Revelation 15, 8, the way is closed. The, the inner sanctum is, is cordoned off by the violent fury, the, the smoke, the impenetrable barrier of, of God's holiness about to judge the earth. And the four living beings aren't in there. And the angels can't go in. And the glorified and redeemed saints can't get in. And, and those of us reading this text aren't in there. No one is able to enter 
during this time, the time of the last seven plagues. It's a striking statement. The whole point of the Bible is God will dwell with his people. And here is a scene where you can't get in. You remember 1 Samuel 4, when the glory of God had departed the tabernacle, was out of the tent, had to name your kid Ichabod. The glory is gone. Ezekiel 8 to 11 depicts the departure of the glory of God and his manifest presence from the temple in Jerusalem. Turn to Exodus chapter 32. Genesis, Exodus, chapter 32. You think about world history and what has happened since, say, the glory of God left the temple in Jerusalem. Was it ever back there? By the time you get to the temple in Jesus' day, the the Herodian temple, Jesus still called that building a, a house of prayer belonging to his father. And it was beautiful on the outside, one of the wonders of the ancient world, magnificent, gleaming, brilliant, and beautiful, but But there was nothing on the inside. It was empty. The ark was gone. The manifest presence of the glory of God was gone. We must still cry, Ichabod, where is the glory? Of course, the glory of God came cloaked and showed up at the temple in person in the earthly ministry of Jesus. But you understand that the tension in all of the Bible is the holy presence of God and the sinfulness of man just aren't going together. And this tension is all the way through. In Exodus 32, we have the story of the golden calf. And I'll summarize it. The, the people put their jewelry together and formed something tangible they could worship and play before Verse 7, Yahweh spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people whom you brought out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They've quickly turned aside from the way that I commanded them. They've made for themselves a molten calf. They've worshipped it, have sacrificed to it. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And Yahweh said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are a stiff-necked people. And look at verse 10. Have you seen this before? Now let me alone. Let me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may consume them. And then Moses, I'll make you a great nation. That tension burst forth in Exodus 32. And God wants to be alone in his anger, ready to burst forth on a rebellious people. What happens in that verse, of course, Moses prays. Here is intercessory prayer, staying execution. And Moses prays and appeals to Yahweh on the basis of Yahweh's covenant. Do you you understand the problem if, if Moses did what any of us would do? Oh, forget those rebellious people. They've been trouble for me this whole time. You mean you're going to start over with me and my family? Great. What's the problem with that solution? Moses was not of the tribe of Judah, from which was promised Messiah. You and I could not have our sins forgiven if God wipes them out in the desert there and starts over with Moses. Moses appeals to God on the basis of covenant and prays that God would do exactly what God promised he would do. And so God relents from the threatened punishment, turned away from doing what they deserved, And he turned to doing what he promised he would do. And God used prayer as a means to his decreed end, to his covenanted end. It's a remarkable scene. When we get to Revelation 15, and God says, let me alone that I may consume them. There is no intercessor. There is no prayer. No intermediary. There is nothing left to be done with this rebellious world. No mercy, no more patience, 
God will be solitary in his hour of judgment. Give him room. Psalm 76, 7 says, You are to be feared, and who may stand in your presence when once you are angry? Jeremiah wrote this in Lamentations chapter 3. We lift up our heart and hands toward God in heaven. We have transgressed and rebelled. You have not pardoned. You have covered yourself with anger and pursued us. You have slain and have not spared. You have covered yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can pass through. What Jeremiah felt and sung about as he watched the destruction of Jerusalem will be absolutely true in this scene in Revelation 15. The cloud of God's fury ready to burst out in a final series of judgments and nothing to be done for this world. It reminds me of the darkness at Calvary. Do you remember when the world went dark when Jesus hung on a cross? The wrath of God was being poured out, not on a rebellious world, but for a rebellious world of people who would believe on the son of his love. And the world went dark, and Jesus bore the wrath, and our intermediary, our intercessor, our go-between, the one who prays for us, prayed and was not heard. Do you remember it? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And heaven was silent, and Jesus was alone under the wrath of God that we deserved. If you have believed the gospel, you are covered. You are protected from God, by God, unto God. You are forgiven. You are loved ineffably. If you are not in Jesus, you know there is an hour coming when God will not hold back. There will be none to stay his hand, none that could beg for mercy, only judgment. You have this day the opportunity to turn to God in love, believe the gospel. We who walk on this earth as followers of Christ are thankful for scenes like this because we see once again that God is in charge. He will not be overruled at the voting booth this week. He will not be undone by rebellions that we suffer under. His decree, his purpose, his plan, his love for his own will go unthwarted until he has rescued all who are his. But then he will set things right. He will do away with the bully on the block. He will be done with evil. He will vindicate his own name and he will rescue his people once and for all into the eternal goodness of the kingdom of his beloved son. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we hear these words, we see these words written on a page and we believe them. Help our unbelief help our distractions. Would you center our thoughts around the things that matter for eternity, recalibrate what we love? Would you reinvigorate our evangelism, our training and sending people to New Orleans and Papua New Guinea and everywhere else that doesn't have the gospel? Would you send us out this week as compassionate ambassadors walking through a world that is not our home. We are pilgrims on this earth. We long to be home. And in your good plan, you have not seen fit to take us there yet. You have us here for a short time. To be used by you, we pray, to rescue many. Help us in that, in Jesus' name. Amen.